Gracious Heavenly Father, I just give you all the thanks for all that you've done to fit us for heaven and to fit us by your grace to live a life that is holy, unblameable, and unreprovable in your sight. I just ask that you would filter out all, all of the error, all of the foolishness, but just seal to our hearts that which is truth. For it's in Christ's name I pray. Amen. Hi, this is Steve again here at blessedhopeforever.com. We've been studying together in the epistle to Titus verse by verse. And in our last few studies together, we had arrived uh, somewhere around verse 6 of chapter 2. Young men. Before we get started, I'd like for you to just, just take a note of the words that I've highlighted here on the screen where that the emphasis is on the word, uh, the emphasis being on doctrine, that is teaching, as well as speech, which the word defines as sound or healthy, healthy teaching and speech. Six times we see this in the first 10 verses, six times. So just take a moment to look at that and try to wrap your mind around the fact that the, the emphasis by the Holy Spirit is on healthy teaching as well as healthy speech. I'm going to jump ahead here just a bit. Verse, verse 11 and 12. For the grace of God, the grace of God that brings salvation hath appeared to all men teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. And just to be sure that we don't place ourselves under law, the Holy Spirit starts out with the word grace. Now folks, I know that this is so easy to miss it's so easy to take for granted that word grace. I think that's part of the problem in people's understanding of this passage. They don't really take the time to truly meditate on the words that the Holy Spirit is presenting as well as the order in which He presents those words. It is the grace of God that brings deliverance. That's not redemption, but deliverance. He's talking to us. He's talking to God's people. And it's the grace of God that teaches us, that educates us. Not only is this grace educating us, but it is enabling us. This is what I want you to really look closely at here folks, teaching us that denying, and the word denying is an aorist participle in the middle voice, which indicates that God's grace enables us to deny ungodliness and worldly lusts. The word teaching is a present active participle, so God is doing the teaching. We're not doing the teaching. God is. God is teaching us through grace. And before that educational process begins, there is a denial. A denial that's also enabled by grace. Yet the common approach to this verse is that, well, this is a responsibility that ought to be undertaken by Christians there's just more stuff to do. It doesn't matter how we approach it, how we do it, does, as long as we do it. How grace, that's how grace, how sweet the sound, okay? But, it's, but we don't build on that doctrine of grace, folks, and I don't want you to miss this. Grace, doctrine, deliverance, which, which is not redemption. This is speaking of, of how we are to live or, or conduct ourselves as God's children. Grace, 
doctrine, deliverance are for the most part ignored. When grace is the very substance whereby we deny ungodliness and worldly lusts and, and we live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. Both ungodliness and worldly lusts are articulated words in the Greek. The denying is a word which means to repudiate. That's what the word means. In verse 16, chapter 1, they profess that they know God, but in works they deny Him. The verb there is a present tense. They are constantly denying Him. They are constantly repudiating Him. And in our case here, the word deny is an aorist. It sees the action as a whole, having denied, having repudiated. God's grace enables us to deny or repudiate. The aorist tense sees the action as a whole. In this present world, the world there is actually age. In this present age, there is a spirit of the age that surrounds us that is not based on God's grace. It's not based on sound, healthy teaching. whereby the grace of God is what teaches us to repudiate that which is not of God so that through grace we live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present age. I don't know how many times I've heard Christians say, Oh, grace, you know, that just, you know, grace, that's, that's such a sloppy word. You know, we can just, you know, if we've received all this grace, well, then we can just live however we want. You know, as if somehow works are apart from grace. You know, grace is one thing, works is another. We've been given grace, but we, because of that, we give back God our works. Well, in a, in, a, in a strange sort of sense, it's true if it's built on grace, but not if we separate grace from it entirely and, and think that grace is one thing and our works is another. Well, it's good that we got grace, but we still got to keep the law. I believe what is encompassed in the, in the articulated word, the godliness, which it is said that we have denied or repudiated, is a spirit that, though, it, 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 though it's not going to deny the existence of God, it uses religious terms which, as far as God is concerned, are blasphemous. People are basically religious. They're not godly. And there's a big difference. And we as Christians live in the most poisonous environment that you could possibly imagine, spiritually speaking. The Christian community that I see seems largely occupied with your physical condition, and I believe that this book is largely occupied with your spiritual condition. I see us living in the most poisonous of atmospheres, the, the prince and the power of the air, the spirit of the age. And when we read of the spirit of the age in Ephesians chapter 2, you know, I, I believe Satan is the prince and power of the air, but I believe that the, that spirit of this world is the ungodliness that's mentioned here. It is an age that at the moment, Satan at least feels that he's running. It has demons in it. It has messengers that will do his bidding. And it is filled with the non-elect. Who, you know, whether they're willing to admit it or not, are deeply committed to ungodliness deeply committed to ungodliness, deeply devoted to ungodliness. They, they may not even realize it. Folks, I'm talking about in a spiritual context, a religious context, a Christian environment. I'm not talking about the world. I'm talking about the world religious system based on unmerit.
That is what we have repudiated. You know, who deny the power of God. They deny His power. They deny the personality of God. They deny the intervention of God in the human life, the direction, the sovereignty of God. And they deny the redemption that was provided by God through Christ. A world religious system based on human merit. Satan, the father of all lies. He knows he can't send us to hell. So his primary concern is our having confidence in, this, in, in self. Confidence in the flesh. Rather than our trusting in Christ. So he arrays his messengers as ministers of truth. It is his, his utmost desire that Christ's glory not appear here. And I want you to, please, I, I, I wish I could get you guys to just kind of set that, those words aside. It'd be great if you could just take and write them down. I'm going to come back to those words here in a little bit. So that Christ's glory not appear here. He's the God of this world. His masterpiece was creating a Christian religious system which believes that it's glory, uh, giving glory to God. It believes it's glorifying God. When in truth, it's actually robbing God of it. His masterpiece was creating a religious system which believes that it is obedient to God when in fact it, it's being disobedient to the Word. A system that dishonors God in its honoring of God. A system of religion that believes that it's working for God, laboring heavily for God, when in truth, it's actually working and laboring heavily for that which is not truth. Yeah, I, I believe that that is Satan's masterpiece, the most beautiful portrait of himself in God's place here on earth since he knows that he'll never possess that position in, in eternity. That system comprises the majority of what is called Christianity today. The majority. We have seen that majority mentioned in the text. A carnal, legalistic, law-based, natural, fleshly institution or organization which labors heavily to promote a righteousness that's based on law, a righteousness that's based on human will, that man is, ultimately man is, is autonomous, God is not. Human will and human effort. If you turn to 2 Timothy 4, verses 3 and 4, it clearly says, For the time will come when people will not put up with sound doctrine. That's what we're looking at here in this chapter. Chapter 2 of Titus, folks. Instead, to suit their own desires, they will gather around them, listen, a great number of teachers to say what their itch itching ears want to hear. They will turn their ears away from the truth and turn aside to myths. Now, how frightening to be one of those great number of teachers. Just a bit of sarcasm there. I just I couldn't resist throwing that in. Those great number of teachers will not be found in the teaching of sound biblical doctrine, folks. I, I see the effects of that poisonous atmosphere even in the body of Christ. Folks, please listen to me. The very foundation of this ministry is actually described in verses 11 and 12. It's almost a summary of it. For the grace of God that brings deliverance has appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, 
in the religious sense, the fleshly sense, the carnal sense. Law. That we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. That practically summarizes every message that this ministry has taught on the grace of God for the past three years and the effect that God's grace has in our lives. Healthy teaching. There seems to be a great sickness among Christians. You know, the conviction that God is not sufficient, that Christ's work was not sufficient. I see the verse saying that in the midst of the most poisonous atmosphere that you can possibly imagine, in the presence of dangers that far exceed your ability or mine to define them and understand them, God's grace is sufficient. We are not under law, but grace. It is God's grace that educates us, that trains us. It, it is His grace that, that upholds us that strengthens us, that delivers us. That having denied ungodliness and worldly desire and immediately, immediately, our minds always seem to leap into law-keeping as a rule of life when we read those words. And folks, that is not what this passage of Scripture is teaching. If God's grace is not sufficient to urge you to love Him, to live for Him, to sacrifice for Him, then nothing else will. Frightening you is not going to do it. Fear won't do it. Law certainly never did. It is God's love manifested through His grace that drives me to want to please Him and to live for Him. And I'm persuaded that many Christians have never learned what God's love or God's grace really is. He not only loves you, He loves you so much that He gave His only begotten Son to die in your place. And now, He educates you. In the midst of a very poisonous atmosphere. And not only does He do that, but He empowers you to live as He would have you live because of the grace that He's bestowed upon your life. That He's flooded really would be a better word, into your life. Like a tidal wave. And it amazes me that it's to so many Christians, that's not good enough. A tsunami of love and grace is not good enough. There's no other constraint here, folks, but God's grace teaching us that having denied or repudiated the ungodliness and the worldly desires, those words are articulated, that we might live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present age. That is, live as who we are. We've been made the righteousness of God in Christ. I'm, I'm hoping that you'll see here that these words are given us in a spiritual context, not a physical context, but a spiritual one. Now, you've got every right to look at, at the ungodliness and the worldly passions here as, you know, going to bars and rock concerts and whatever else. But I do not think for one second that that is what it's talking about. The ungodliness, the worldly desires in a religious a spiritual context, a body context. So this is something that I ought to do, and maybe I will, and maybe I won't. There are, there are pastors who don't look at the subjunctive there as really meaning very much, believe it or not, but I do. I see the subjunctive mood. And I'm going to suggest that this is something that we may do and we may not. What does this grace do? It educates me. And it empowers me to live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present age. 
but the subjunctive mood of the verb there is the mood of uncertainty. Positionally, you are righteous, but that doesn't mean that you'll live like that. I mean, I, I can't help folks but see the judgment seat of Christ factor into this. There is such a thing as hay, wood, and stubble. We know that the new man can't sin. We know that the old man, that's all he does is sin. And we know that we are not under law, but grace. The question here is how are we going to live? By grace or by law? Christians can live under the law. Living is who we are. Not, not who we're not. Folks, these are not instructions given to the flesh as if all of a sudden now, well, we're back under law. Well, we're not back under law. We, we were never under, under the law to begin with. You can't bring law into this text. You know, that, that somehow if we just cleaned, cleaned up the old man, that, then we would live according, you know, to what the, you know, soberly, righteously, Godly. You know, if we just clean up the old man, you can't do that, folks. You can't do that with the text. We don't do anything apart from the concept of grace. Am I living soberly, righteously, and godly because I love him or because I fear him? What is the driving motive? However, you look at this. It is the grace of God doing the empowering. You cannot argue with the text. You can't make it say something that it's not. And we're either new creations in Christ who stand before Him without spot and without blemish, or we are not. You know, I, here's something amazing. I, I recently received a comment on my last Titus video in which the person basically suggested, in a nutshell, that the grace that I was teaching here in Titus would lead to ungodliness. That's not that I haven't heard that before, but I just found the timing a little uncanny, you know? Suggesting that the grace of God itself, as well as I, myself, would then be responsible for someone living as ungodly because I'm teaching grace, because I'm putting grace in front of, of, our, of our life here. The timing of which I found really interesting given the fact that what we are looking at here in the second chapter right now is declaring precisely the opposite. Without any doubt, in my mind, the popular Christian conscience suggests that Christians ought to be holy, unblameable, and unreprovable, but they're really not. However, they, they have a desire to be that way, and therefore, since they desire to be that way, well, they're better than those who don't desire to be that way. And so we come up with all kinds of rationalizations that's based on faulty human reasoning and logic. Either you are wholly unblameable and unreprovable in God's sight, folks, or you are not. Which God did, made you that way, by reconciling you unto Himself through His death, in which you had no part in that reconciliation whatsoever, because it was done while you were still His enemy. It is not the law of God that enables you to live soberly, righteously, and godly. It is the grace of God. If the grace of God has not touched your heart, made you a new creation in Christ, then the language that we speak is, is a foreign language. There is an enabling power here. I want you to be aware. God has not forgotten you and God has not forsaken you. He, he didn't... He didn't send a son to die in your place just, and then just to let you run free. You, you've been bought with a price. And for the record, 
and I've said this on numerous occasions, the very word redemption declares that he bought back what was already his. He purchased what was already what already belonged to him. Okay? And you were enabled by the grace of God to live a life that is acceptable to God. I know that I do that, which is not pleasing and not in conformance with the Word of God. And God doesn't pull any punches, but He points out to me that that's the old man and that I have put off the old man and I've put on the new man, which is renewed in knowledge after the image of Him that created Him. Ephesians chapter 3. Not renewed in knowledge by your effort, well, you know, while you strive to meet the demands of the law, but by Jesus Christ. That is what living soberly, righteously, and godly in this present age means. That's the new man. You are His. You're His by birth. You're His because He bought you. You're His because He paid the price. He loves you with an everlasting love. And you're enabled to walk in a highly dangerous environment with head held high, knowing that there's no judgment, no condemnation to those of you who are in Christ Jesus. God has done a mighty work, folks. And one of the aspects of the atmosphere in which you and I live is to reduce the magnitude of that work and the sovereignty of the God who did it and increase the majesty of the recipient to elevate man above God. Now, you won't hear that stated from any pulpit I've never heard a pastor say that. But that is what emanates from most pulpits today because this religious system has designed a system that is devoid of sound biblical doctrine. And He's coming soon. Our Lord is... is I know He's returning soon. And folks, I so want you to know this. Because we will all stand before Him and give an account for how we lived our lives. Verse 1, But speak thou the things which become sound, that is, healthy doctrine, healthy teaching. Though most Christians would never admit it, I'm persuaded that their conviction is that God began a process and then it's up to them to finish. You know, it's... They've got to complete it. And though that may be a very simple way of suggesting it, it ignores the danger of the conflict. I will guarantee you that if it is up to you to finish it, folks, you'll lose. That you're up against an enemy that is bigger than you. If the ultimate responsibility is yours, folks, you've had it. But your life is hid with Christ in God. we'll soon see in a couple of verses that He died in our place. He didn't die to offer us something which we may or may not take. This book says He gave us eternal life. It doesn't say He offered it. He died in our place. Who gave Himself for us, says the text. His death for us. It was not provisional or conditional, but substitutionary. He died in our place. We can walk without fear, in reverence toward God. If you tell God's people that they, they cannot lose, they'll be excited and they'll be enticed to listen. Do you know the God of all comfort and the God of all love? Dearly beloved, if His love for you will not do it, no threat, no law will do it. God has promised you triumph and victory. He's enabling you to live in a fatal environment without danger of losing, without danger of defeat. Never will you be separated from the God who bought you. You know, it's wonderful to realize that I'm surrounded by His love and by His grace, that I am 
I am held in his, in his hand, upheld by his sovereign power. Wonderful to know that he's committed himself to me, that he would never under any circumstances leave me nor forsake me. But there's a hope that faces me. Verse 13. Take a look at verse 13, folks. Looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. You can't help but see His deity there. The word looking is a present tense. It is a middle voice verb. Constantly looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of of the great God, our Savior, Jesus Christ. And I know you think you might know what that means, but I'm gonna question that. Now folks, in the past, I've pointed out to you that there are rules of Greek grammar. There's rules of English grammar. Now you can abide by those rules or you cannot. But there is a rule of Greek grammar. And I believe that we should live by the rules of grammar. There is in Greek what is known as the Granville Sharp Rule. It's a rule of grammar that says, if there are two nouns in the same case, the first of which is articulated and the second of which is not, and they're connected by a conjunction, such as in this case the word and, then they mean the same thing. The second one is simply an elaboration of the first or, or a further definition of the first, and that's what we see here. Looking for the blessed hope, and there's a definite article before blessed hope, but there is no definite article before glorious appearing. Okay? The English translation says the glorious appearing, but the problem with the glorious appearing is that it gives you the, the wrong idea of the Greek phrase, the Greek word. The Greek says the appearing of His glory. And that is a tremendously different meaning. What we're looking for at the present time in this particular context, listen to me. I'm not trying to take away, I'm, talk, I'm not trying to burst anyone's bubble about the rapture here. But what we are looking at in this present context is the appearing of His glory. And folks, that is what the spirit of this age doesn't see. They don't comprehend the glory, the majesty, and the sovereignty of our God. Dearly beloved, there will come a day. We all, we all know this. And soon, Many of us believe there'll come a day when there will be the appearance of His glory, the revealing of His glory, the epiphany of His glory. But in our present text here, it isn't the glorious appearing, it is the appearing of His glory. We will fall at His feet. We'll cast our crowns before Him. We'll sing praises to the God of all eternity who redeemed us by His grace. But the rules of Greek grammar here reveal this to not be future, but our present blessed hope. I love you all. I truly do. We'll pick up here next time. Thank you for all of your, your prayers, your messages, your love, your support. Thanks for watching.